shouldn't be too long. <coughs> I've just got ground three and then a couple of dotting of eyes and crossing of T's for ground one to cover. If my submission on ground two, the public policy point, was correct, and there was at the very least a misapplication or a mis exercise of the discretion on the basis of not taking into account a relevant matter. We say that there well, was he did, also he did he did take it into account, surely, if you look at paragraph fifty six two, what he says is there's no public policy which um, prevents the jurisdiction being exercised and the overriding policy consideration is Forsters. So it looks to me, at least on one reading, as if having set out all of your arguments, he's saying he does take it into account, but he thinks it's, well, we say it's overridden, in which, we in which case you'd have to say that's wrong as a matter of law, wouldn't you? Yes, but we say that when you have an overriding public policy issue, what you're saying is this one outweighs everything else possible. I can ignore everything else. This is no longer a balancing act. It is simply I'm going to take into account Broadster's pay, 281 sub 3 public policy. And that's precisely what he says. The overriding public policy consideration is that contained in 281 sub 3. Broadster's should not prosper. There's no public policy which prevents a second 37 month jurisdiction being exercised. Now, prevents, I accept, is an ambiguous term, but overriding is unambiguous. There's nothing else that's being taken into account in those circumstances. And even if he is taking it into account, he's dismissing it with such uh, a light touch that it is wrong in law. Now that point, are you taking it into account or are you not, comes out again in ground three, the issue of effective costs to the appellant. 56 sub 3, in the exercise of my discretion, I find that it's just excellent and convenient for the civil claimants, subject to necessary amendments, blah, blah, blah. There are compelling reasons for the claimants who are among those who have been defrauded by Mr. Green to be able to have access to my stuff by the judgment. And interestingly, he goes on to say, None of the points made on behalf of Mr. Green set out in paragraph 51 uh, detract from this. It's not a question of none of them weigh against them. It's none of them detract. It's a simple win. They do not merit weight. Interestingly, he goes on to say, indeed, the fact that revocation of the enhanced protection is unlikely to have any practical impact upon him is a point in favour of granting the None of the other points are appointed against granting. But a point in favour of granting relief sort, not declining to make it. I'll come back to that. That's not how it works. And then the last sentence. I attach little weight to the possible impact of a future contingent event of a compromise to the claimant. He doesn't attach any weight to the other points. Now, little weight, fine. Couldn't argue about that. Exercise discretion, he's assigned a hand to do it. But none of them detract. Not none of them have any impact. None of them detract. Clearly saying that the issues raised, in particular the costs, do not go against the order at all. He simply looked at the question of whether or not a fraudster should pay and then ignored everything else. And that, to be fair, is very much the tenor of the judgment here, the tenor of the hearing. And this is exactly the problem that my client has faced. Give a dog a bad name and hang him. I fully accept. So if he had used the word outweigh yeah. instead of detract from, you'd have no appeal. Yeah, but he didn't. And to be yeah, blunt, but that is, as, it's as narrow as that, though, isn't it? It's not. A, it is as narrow as that, but B, it's not as technical as that. The fact that he didn't use it is, in fact, representative of the fact that he just didn't care about my client's position. He just saw my client as a fraudster, so it didn't matter. And that's wrong. And the fact that he openly says it is helpful to me. And it's absolutely how the judge saw this case. He didn't take into account the impact on the debtor. He just said, your client's a fraudster. I don't care about the impact on the debtor because the debtor should pay full stop. And that cannot be right. If for no other reason, and section 37.1 requires the injunction to be just and convenient. 
He had to take into account the impact on both sides. And he didn't. And he also says that we said that there was uh, unlikely to have any practical impact upon him as a point in favour of granting relief sought. We simply did not say that. If you jump back to paragraph 55, Finally submitted, it's not just equitable or convenient to make an order against Mr. Green. He's already gone bankrupt. He's not going to abuse the system, and there's no suggestion that efforts to achieve the right level of attention either in any way that results in dishonesty or the events giving rise to judgment debt is already true. Uh, making the proposed order will trigger a substantial additional tax charge, although in all, and this is the problematic bit, although in all submissions, Mr. Mann candidly admitted that the loss of enhanced protection is unlikely to have any practical effect on Mr. Green. Given his personal circumstances, and the existing worldwide freezing order. Now, the worldwide freezing order at the time limited any income to £500 per week. The consequence is that in the short term, in the short term, while the worldwide freezing order was there, it wouldn't make any impact. Not that it wouldn't make any impact at all. Why highlight the, wor the existing worldwide freezing order? Because when the worldwide freezing order comes up for reconsideration, or the worldwide freezing order is dismissed, and there is an income payment sort of placed in, in its place, other matters take account. And the question is, at that stage, is there going to be additional, are there going to be additional funds that could be paid to the debtor? It's a situation where you have to take into account all the consequences, all the, all the circumstances of the debtor, it's his other debts, his expenses, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a standard in income payment order application. <clears throat> it's possibly worth flagging up that questions of how to assess income payment order liability versus income payment when you're looking at a pension are quite complicated. But also, if you're looking at it at a particular juncture in time, you've got to think about the future. It's, it's a, an example is given in the case of Re Henry at uh, paragraph 47, maybe just the garden of the tree, saying if you're going to assess income payments orders, how do you take into account the future in, the, in this circumstance? But we didn't say that this wouldn't have any impact on the debtor at all. We said in the current circumstances it wasn't going to, and that's true, but it obviously has an impact. That wasn't reflected in the judgment at all. You just said, oh, wonderful, you've said no impact whatsoever. I can ignore the impact. So can, can you just spell out how it does work? Right. Um, so if you take away enough of the pension, you get a reduced pension pot to provide yes. an income stream. We've ended up with a pension pot of available funds in the pension pot of just under a million pounds. A 55-year-old male. At the moment, you probably get somewhere around 33, maybe 36,000 pounds a year. Given the last week, you'll probably get about 25,000 pounds. But you'll get whatever you get. You have 2 million pounds, you get 66. Now, after you take account of income tax, mortgage payments, liabilities, etc., you see what the, on an income payment order, you see what the uh, available sums are to A, support the, the debtor, and B, pay off the creditor. If you've got a sufficiently small amount, creditors don't get anything. And just thinking that through, is it, so I hadn't really thought about how this relates to the bankruptcy. Um, so suppose that the judge's order stands, the lump sums come in, those don't go anywhere near the bankruptcy. None of this goes near the bankruptcy. The bankruptcy is in the past now. Bankruptcy has been discharged. So where does the income payments order come in? You seek an income payments order as a creditor. So when you get, you get two types oh, of you, you, So you don't mean a bankruptcy income payments order? No, I mean, uh, oh, uh,
Sorry, attachment of earning. Sorry, my learned friends help. Attachment of earning. I'm sorry. Attachment of earning. It's my mistake. Yes, sir. Sorry, I, I was getting confused because of um, in Re Henry they're talking about an income payments order yes. because it was in a bankruptcy. But it's a, it's similar considerations to be taken into account with an income payments order compared to an attachment of earning. I apologise. So the thesis is that you might get that the creditor might be able to might not be able to attach all the money that came in or uh, at the moment probably the creditor would get nothing yes because the amount left in the pot to pay for a pension is so small that it's producing an income that is so small that after tax it's going to be basically meeting our needs and nothing more as the as the capital goes up you must at some point reach a point where it produces sufficient income to pay the debtor's <coughs> needs <coughs> and then the rest of it tends to go towards creditors. Let me point out the plural creditors. When you say creditors, any any liabilities that my client has, for example, mortgages or uh, so say post bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is after, for example, yeah, you have to take into account you get income. It's subject to income tax. That tends to come off the top first. You don't get attachment of earnings orders going. You get five hundred pounds. We'll take the first two hundred pounds, and we don't care how much tax it is. You get five hundred pounds. There's a hundred pounds of tax. Then you have four hundred pounds. We'll take whatever comes off that. It goes that way. And of course, pension payments are subject to tax. <clears throat> so necessarily, whatever is coming in is going to make a difference, at least potentially, to my client's position. And we never suggested. But it was without impact on our client. That is simply not accurate, as is indicated by the terms of the judgment. If you've got a current freezing order that says you get £500 per week and the current amount coming out, yeah, fine. But the freezing order isn't going to stay forever, and then you get an attachment of earnings order. And that takes into account income, etc., etc. So he, the judge, I mean, necessarily got this wrong. He discarded this as a relevant issue. Again, this comes back to, got it wrong, didn't take it into account, comes back to the court to exercise the discretion, this court to exercise the discretion. We say that this is a tax charge of 1.6 million. <coughs> in a fund where they're gonna get 1.6 million themselves. Of course, that level of tax being spent must be of significance when they're exercising discretion. Now, as the case of Lindsay against O'Lochnain, authorities tab 19 points out, the fact that there is tax is not, as a matter of principle, contrary to exercising enforcement proceedings. So, for example, you get a charging order with an order for sale, all that's going to do is, well, it's necessarily going to trigger the potential for CGT, but that's not a reason not to do it. But the amount of tax necessary still goes to whether or not you should exercise discretion. It's not a black and white yes, no. It's a possibility. And the example given in Lindsay, Lindsay CGT is triggered on the sale of a property, is inherent within charging order, inherent within a sale of property. Here, there are different opportunities or different options for the performance or payment of this judgment day. So various matters to consider. And yes, it does trigger tax, and it's not a black and white answer to it, but such a massive amount of tax is important. A couple of basic other points. There's a an argument that we were not actually putting forward this as a genuine reason for dealing with it. It's actually to suggest that the, the force the other side into negotiation. It would certainly uh, impact on negotiation for settlement. But it's not the only reason for doing this. There is a statement in Malone Friends Skeleton that there has been no attempt by my client to settle this. You've got to be careful about this because of without prejudice. Um, there have been no offers on without prejudice made by my client, but that's not saying that there haven't been without prejudice offers. It's a bit complicated, but it's not as simple and as straightforward as saying there's been no attempt to settle this. But the 
really fundamental point is, is it justifiable to trigger and generate a further liability which is not necessarily there against my client, which is equal to the amount of money being paid as a credit? Is that, is that convenient or is that just? And we say it's not just. I mean, I suppose there might be another way of looking at it, might there? The pension pot you've got is worth no more than the amount you owe. Correct. So you might say, well, there's no injustice in the creditor getting as much as we can out of that. Um, uh, it may be that um, one particular scenario would mean you get to keep more of it, but why should you uh, in circumstances where the totality is no more than the judgment debt. So then one asks oneself, um, could there be some further detriment to you beyond the pension pot? Well, there, we're told you haven't got any other money. Um, so you No, I accept that. But in this particular case, it's not just a question of do they get it? It's what's the cost of them getting it? It's a balancing act. But it doesn't, since if you don't have any real stake in... But we do. We do. If, it's, if this doesn't end up going into... Uh, all the money going effectively by lump sum and massively reducing the, the pension pot available to pay for an income stream. Um, if that doesn't happen, then we probably get something more by way of at least attachment of, under an attachment of earnings order. You would get to keep more of this fund, even yes. though the fund in its totality uh, is uh, no greater than the amount yeah. you owe. Um, but so actually, and we would only get to do that if it was seen assess, uh, uh, as, as reasonable under an attachment of earnings order. Because if we, we wouldn't take more than we needed to under the attachment of earnings order, because the attachment of earnings order would say, this is what you need, this is what you get, after that the creditor would get. I mean, the tax, in a sense, depletes what the creditor gets. Yes. It depletes what everybody gets, but it also, in, within that, it depletes what the creditor gets. I mean, it gets it sooner. But it's yes. I mean, it's, it's a cash stream issue. Time value of money type. Now, if we don't go down the lifetime allowance excess lump sum route, the outstanding debt is such that the interest accruing exceeds probably what they'd be getting under an attachment of earnings. Probably, yes. Doesn't mean they wouldn't get more. It's, a, as you say, a question of when, not if. So, the judge having discarded the impact or dis... dis uh, or failed to take account of the impact on our client and said that there was no impact on the client, which was plainly wrong and not what we said. Leaves it open to your lordships to assess this. And then you're left with, is this a reasonable exercise of the discretion? How should the court exercise it? And we say, given the massive, and we are talking massive cost, 55% tax charge, more than half of what is coming out by way of an LAELS, goes to the tax man. Is that sensible? Is that, is that convenient? And is that just? And we say it just isn't. And Maloney Friend will say, oh, well, he's a debtor he has to pay. Doesn't matter how much it costs him to pay more. That's not entirely, that cannot be right. It has to be a necessary balancing exercise. If they get 10 pounds and it costs us 20 million, that's Barbie. If they get 20 million and it costs us 10 pounds, fine. They're obviously entitled to it. And we're somewhere in between. They, it costs us more to pay them this than they would get. If we don't do it, they get 325,000 on lump sum plus income stream and it doesn't cost us 1.6 million of tax that's the problem right I've gone past, way past where I was planning on saying I come back very quickly I pause any questions on ground 3? didn't think so um, very quickly I'm coming back to the point raised by my Lord Justice Arnold Whether or not you need to have a legal or equitable right being impinged for the application of Section 37. And of course, my Lord, you're quite correct. Convoy collateral and broad idea highlights the fact that Section 37, just because of its width, does not necessarily require this as a matter of jurisdiction. And it becomes a question as highlighted in broad idea of the application of how to exercise that jurisdiction. 
I would flag up broad idea at paragraph 57 where it's where the court cites or Lord Leggett cites uh, Spry an exposition of the court's equitable powers to graft injunctions it will be difficult to improve on the following passage in Spry <coughs> the powers of courts with equitable jurisdictions to grant injunctions are subject to any relevant statutory restriction and I flag that I'll come back to it unlimited injunctions are granted only when to do so a cause with equitable principles, but this restriction involves not a defect of powers, but an adoption of doctrines and practices that change their application from time to time. And this is the point, this is the developing jurisdiction. Unfortunately, there have been, there are sometimes been made observation by judges that tend to confuse questions of jurisdiction of, or of powers with questions of discretions or of practice. And this is the whole point I think you're watching to make. The preferable analysis involves a recognition of the great width of equitable powers, you could do anything in theory, an historical appraisal of the categories of injunctions that have been established, and an acceptance that pursuant to general equitable principles, injunctions may issue in new categories when this course appears appropriate. This passage, stated in the same terms as the early edition of Spry's, was quoted in Broadmoor by Lord jo uh, Master of Wolves, Lord Wolfe, who described as succinctly summarising the correct position. It goes on that basis. And you don't want to straight jacket the court, it goes on at paragraph 58, you don't want to straight jacket the court. In normal circumstances, an injunction, and I emphasize in normal but not all circumstances, an injunction will not be granted, save to protect a legal or equitable right. I do accept there are circumstances in which that may not apply, but in this particular case, because the position on what enforcement procedures are available is fixed by the CPR, which is, of course is statute, statutory instrument here, the jurisdiction under Section 37 is limited as to what it can do. And in any event, whilst it is not absolutely necessary to have a right legal or equitable to be protected by an injunction, it would be bizarre to exercise a power under Section 37 if there wasn't a right, at least ultimately, that was being protected or advanced. And indeed, and I've got copies of uh, Cartier to hand over, but indeed in Cartier, the question whether or not there was a right and whether it could be enforced, there was lots of debate in it about whether or not there was a right to, an, an obligation on the people to, on, on the website manage people to stop uh, IS, uh, intellectual property abusers. And at the end, he the court emphasized Article 11 of a particular European directive that gave it the power to apply injunctions as against intermediaries. Yes, but the whole point of the Supreme Court's decision was that it was held that it could have been done under ordinary principles yes. of equity, and therefore the European provision was irrelevant. Yes, but I would I would emphasise that because you've got that as well, it assists in the assessment of whether or not it could be appropriate to do it under the usual equitable principles. Not necessary, but appropriate. And this is a question of not whether or not it's possible, but whether it's appropriate. So in these circumstances, I would say, you have a limited powers because you do have limited enforcement mechanisms in the first place. And that's a statutory limit. But also, as a matter of practice and discretion, why would you be enforcing through a new means against something that is not proper? However, that was really the point. Now, I've massively gone over my time. Mr. Paul Goderi can shout at me uh, quietly after court. Uh, are there any other questions that I can assist the court with? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bryan. Uh, Mr. Pogadiri. I'm grateful, my lords. Um, I'm going to begin my submission by posing the question that's before this court on ground one, um, identifying the <coughs> five um, objections I discerned from my learned friend's submissions to the relief we seek and, and giving our answer to that before diving into my positive submissions. Uh, and in our submission, my lords, the question before the court is this. Is the Section 37 jurisdiction really so ossified 
that where an asset sits behind two powers instead of one, those assets cannot be reached. And my learned friend had five answers to that, I think. The first was, he said, what we're doing is creating an asset. That's wrong. We are not. The asset is there. There is a pension fund worth £3.7 million or thereabouts. What we are concerned with is accessing the asset. The second point my lender friend made was that there is a cost incurred in accessing the asset and that makes it impermissible. But of course, my lords, that cost isn't imposed on Mr Green the money comes straight out of the fund. The third point my lender friend made was that Section 37 can't be used to change rights. That's wrong. As I'll go on to demonstrate, that is precisely what Tassaruf does. If one takes a strict view of property rights, what Tassaruf is doing is it's saying the judgment debtor is being required by Section 37 to create property for himself. Um, in support of that submission, um, my little friend cited an example. He said, well, imagine if you could give a million pounds and in return get two million pounds. Would the court require the exercise of that? And, and my lords, what's being described there is an options contract. Of course a receiver could take an options contract. The fourth objection, my little friend... You can, if the receiver can take the options contract, can he force the person to pay the million pounds to uh, exercise the options? No, because that's generating additional debt on that person. But of course, that's not what we're doing in this case. As I identified in my second point, it's not that Mr Green has to pay money out of his pocket. The money comes out of the asset. Yeah. The fourth point was that um, well, we have a judgment debt, and all that entitles us to is either get paid or the CPR methods of execution. But of course, the whole point of the debate we're having today is that um, Section 37 can be used to assist with execution. And again, that's exactly what Tassaruf does. And the fifth point was a floodgates argument. It was said, well, if you require a these sorts of powers to be executed. What's to stop the court requiring someone to sing a song or write a book? Um, well, those are self-evidently different point, uh, propositions. But the, the principal difference, if one is required, is that we are concerned with assets that can be reached by means of notifications and instructions and the like. And these are the sorts of powers that are delegable. The power to write a song, if you have a contract to write three songs, uh, Sir Elton John can hardly delegate the third song to Mr Moran and I to do a duet. He could delegate the power to make notifications and instructions. So those are the five points I discerned in my learned friend's submissions, and those are our short answers to those. Um, in my primary submissions, I'm first going to address the general principles which apply to section 37 uh, and demonstrate why in this case they apply. And before going on to deal with the purported distinction between powers and property, which my learned friend relies on so heavily. And um, as to the general principles applicable to section 37, and um, you were taken to this to some extent by my learned friend. Point one, section 37 provides a flexible remedy to be exercised in accordance with the demands of justice. A powerful calling of the demand of justice is that judgment debts are satisfied and paid. The section set 37 power can be applied in novel situations where, is, where there is a principal basis to do so. Uh, no precedent is required, and that's the party of case. But in any case, the judgment creditor's right and interest to have their judgment debt paid is a right and interest that section 37 can protect, and it is a principal basis the exercise of that power. And in this case, we have two powers to get us an asset. We have the power to notify HMRC that enhanced protection is being revoked, 
and we have the power to call for the lifetime allowance of excess lump sum. And we say the Section 37 jurisdiction can be exercised in respect of both of those powers. Uh, what's more, my learned friend and I are agreed, we discussed, this was discussed this morning, that if we were just concerned with the lifetime allowance of excess lump sum in one stage, there could be no objection to that being called for. But it's the most minor of incremental advances to subject the power to notify the withdrawal of enhanced protection and, and, and draw that into the 37 power. And it's minor because it's a necessary antecedent to the exercise of that lifetime allowance of excess lump sum. Or to put it another way, if debtors could really hide their assets by putting them behind two powers or a notification in the power, it would be trivially easy to evade judgment. And plainly, that's not a result that this court can countenance. As to the distinction between powers and property, um, the key submissions here are this. Um, there is no formal distinction when we're concerned with this jurisdiction between certain forms of power and property. Rather, one looks at the rights an individual has in relation to an asset and asks, is that package of rights such that we should treat that individual as owning the asset? The question isn't, is the power property? The question is, are the rights of this individual such that the asset at the end of the line can be treated as theirs? And, and I'll demonstrate that by reference to Tassaroff um, and uh, the um, uh, Scrippen decision. Um, the nature of the powers in this case are unfettered, unrestricted, non fiduciary. Mr. Green can exercise them for whatever purpose he likes, um, and they are both powers that are necessary to get hold of a substantial asset. And that's why they can be exercised in this case. Um, so going on to first the general principles, uh, my lords, perhaps I can take you to the cruise um, city judgment. That's tab 13. And paragraph 47, which is at page 200 of the book. Now, I should say that my Lord Lord Justice Mayles' summary of the principles here was cited and approved by the Court of Appeal in the Scriffin decision. Um, so it's not just a uh, first instance. Um, and the points that I'd like to draw your Lordship's attention to are the second sentence of subparagraph A. The demands of justice include the promotion of the policy of English law that judgments of the English court should be complied with, and if necessary, enforced. And of course, here, we're talking about the Section 37 jurisdiction. So when my Lord Lord Justice Mayle says enforced, he doesn't mean enforced only by the routes permitted by CPR 70. He's, my Lord is talking about Section 37. And we see in subparagraph B the point that the jurisdiction is not unfettered. And, but the last sentence, starting with the word specifically, um, the jurisdiction is unconstrained by rigid expressions of principle and responsive to the demands of justice in the contemporary context. Uh, and the last point I'd like to draw your Lordship's attention to is the first part of subparagraph C. Um, the jurisdiction will not be exercised unless there is some hindrance or difficulty in using the normal process of execution. This is a supplement to CPR Part 70. But there are no rigid rules as to the nature of the hindrance or difficulty required, which may be practical or, and this is critical, legal. A classic legal difficulty is that the assets are hidden behind a series of powers in a trust.
next judgment to take uh, your lordships to is, is the Masri decision, tab 11. And there are three issues in Masri. One is whether the power can be exercised in relation to foreign debts. The second is a point about the Brussels regulations, which we don't need to worry about. And the third is the point about future debt. Um, my learned friend took you to a series of passages, starting at page uh, 137 of the PDF, uh, paragraph 52. Uh, and the point that these passages establish is contrary to my own friend's submission that we're focused on CPR Part 70 and those modes of execution. The Section 37 power is different and not so limited. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed your last word. And, and not so limited. Yes, I see. <laughs> But the fetters to the jurisdiction were discussed in the third part of the judgment where it dealt with the problem of future debts. And the principled limit in my submission um, is that set out at paragraph 177. And this has been overruled. So there's the important point is that these decisions, or dicta in them, are concerned mainly with the rule that an injunction is granted only in aid of an equitable or legal right. Now, as we discussed this morning, that's not a strict statement of the law. The jurisdiction is much broader than that. But even if it's limited in that way, we do have a right, and it is the right to have our judgment debt satisfied. And the broad idea case and the Kareva case um, that I'm going to defend drew your attention to um, don't undermine that point. But, but, but none of these authorities suggest that the right to have your judgment debt paid is not a right the Section 37 jurisdiction should protect. So purely from a principle basis, this is a remedy we're entitled to. Now, the main answer to that is that there's a distinction between powers and property, and we're traversing that distinction. Um, and that's based on the Tassaroff judgment, tab 12, for example. And the question of Tassaroff, the issue, was in what circumstances can the holder of a power to dispose of assets under a trust instrument be treated as effectively owning that asset? And there's a shortcut in language which shouldn't obscure the issues here. And, and loosely expressed in some passages and in, indeed in submissions you've heard, the question is put as whether the power is tantamount to ownership. But that isn't the question. The question is whether the rights of the person to reach the asset, and this is the submission I made at the outset, <laughs> are such that he should be treated as owning that asset. And if that is right, if the rights of the person in relation to an asset are such that he should be treated as owning it, then the asset is available to satisfy a judgment. And um, one can see this when one looks at paragraph 59 of the judgment, which expresses the court's fundamental conclusion. And that's at page 183 of the PDF. 1735 of the judgment. The powers of refrigation are such that in equity, in the circumstances of, the, of a case such as this, the judgment debtor can be regarded as having rights tantamount to ownership. And I add sort of voce, rights tantamount to ownership of the asset that is subject of the power. So there are two points I need to make good from Tassaroff. One is, well, that's what's meant, it's tantamount ownership of the asset which is subject to the power. And the second is to make good what it is about these powers that means they can be treated in this way. And, 
and these points are made good at page 179 of the PDF. 171 I, of the authority. Sorry, so... 179. I, I don't think I have a version yeah, okay, with these numbers. Oh, if you 1731. 1731. Yeah. And um, paragraph 43. The penultimate sentence. Well, we'll go before that. A, a donee of a truly general power can appoint the subject matter of the power to himself. He therefore has an absolute disposing power over the property. So what we're concerned with is not, is the power property. We're concerned with what can be done at the end of this power. Can we get to that asset? And then there's a discussion of the nature of the powers in question. Um, and, and the important point about this is, is, is under the heading delegation. Uh, which is page 1733, paragraph 51. The question of whether the power of revocation is delegable arises because Tesserov seeks an order that receivers be appointed over the powers of revocation. And then at the end, the defendants say the powers are not assignable or delegable. And at the next paragraph, we see that a power of appointment is capable of being delegated where the holder of the power owes no duty of trust or confidence to another person. So in other words, it's a totally unrestricted power. There's no fiduciary obligation. You can do whatever you like with it. And one further point to take from Tassarov and this is at paragraph 63, page 1736. Uh, here there's a discussion of um, a judgment in of the High Court, Field and Field in 2003. Um, and the place I'd like to take your lordships to is between uh, letter C and D, the sentence starting with Wilson J. And um, Wilson J thought that to make such an order, the, the order were effectively um, the order that was made of Light and Brewster, the order requiring the PCLS to be paid, would amount to a freestanding enforcement procedure in its own right, which was not permitted by Section 37. The basis for such characterization of the order is not clear. In the present case, the order would be ancillary to Tassarov's rights as judgment creditors. And this really goes to my learned friend's point. But ah, well, the only things you're entitled to are CPR Part 70 and things that are a bit like it. No. We have rights as a judgment creditor. And the Section 37 powers can be used ancillary to those rights. So what we're seeking falls squarely within the principal basis of exercising Section 37. The point about um, the focus being the assets that are at the end of the chain of powers <coughs> is perhaps best illustrated in the um, Scorippan decision, which is at tab 14 of the bundle. Um, this is a decision of the High Court, Christopher Butcher QC, but in a later iteration of the case in the Court of Appeal, um, the judgment was cited and a notice of approval was identified. And, and the part I'd like to take your lordships to um, starts at paragraph 38. And sorry, the issue in this case, I should just explain what the case was about. Um, the applicants were seeking to appoint a receiver over certain membership interests in a limited liability partnership. And the issue, the issue was um, whether and um, those LLP membership interests could be deemed in equity to be Mr. Scorifton's assets. Uh, and the difficulty was the LLP interests were owned via Liechtenstein consults, and it was unclear what Mr. Scorifton's precise 
rights in relation to that Liechtenstein Anstalt were. But at paragraph 38, the question is posed, over what assets may a receiver by way of equitable execution be appointed? And counsel submitted that the answer to this question is that a receiver may be appointed over whatever may be considered in equity as the assets of the judgment debtor. He cited Masri and Blight and Brewster. More specifically in the present context, Mr. Penny submitted that the property subject to trust or analogous foreign arrangements would be regarded in equity as assets of the judgment debtor if he has a legal right to call for those assets to be transferred to him or to his order, or if he has de facto control of the trust asset. So equity would view assets as yours, not only if it can identify specific powers, but de facto control. And that critical paragraph in Tessera, paragraph 59, um, is discussed at paragraph 41 of this judgment, just further down the page. Hold on a moment. Um, 38 and 39 are submissions. Does the judge go oh, on? Oh, yes, sorry. He, he does, my lord, yes. Point. So paragraph 45 over the page. Uh, in my judgment, these authorities do support Mr. Penny's submission. Yep, yep. okay. Asset Thank asset you very much. Which I accept. Um, and paragraph 41, uh, the judgment of um, Lord Collins in Tessera is cited. Uh, and Mr. Penny makes the same point that I'm making today. By this, Mr. Penny submitted, Lord Collins was saying that the judgment debtor had rights tantamount to ownership of the property subject to the settlement. Um, and then there's a discussion of Blight um, and the Pugachev decision as well. And, and Pugachev was concerned with freezing orders, but nevertheless, it's still the Section 37 jurisdiction. Uh, and, and that's where we get to the point about an effective control of assets. Now, this judgment and the point about control was uh, discussed in the Court of Appeal in Skorikin, uh, which is tab 18. Um, and the precise issue in, in, the court, in this judgment was between Mr. Butcher's judgment and a, a few years had passed, and effectively Mr. Squirrickin had done some shuffling around and tried to say, ah, well now, these assets are no longer mine. Um, and the question was whether there'd been a change of circumstance. And at paragraph 73, which is page 452, um, in my judgment, the judge was right to reject the contention for the reasons she gave. Um, but this is the important bit. The decision of Christopher Butcher QC, which was the judgment I've taken you to, to appoint receivers was based on Mr. Skorikin's control. So the Court of Appeal is approving that approach to identifying what the assets are of the judgment debtor. So where does that take us in relation to the court's principled or the principled limits to the Section 37 jurisdiction in this case? Where, um, even where a judgment debtor has de facto control such that he could direct that assets be paid over to him, those assets are deemed in equity the purposes of the Section 37 jurisdiction to be his. If that is right, it cannot matter how many powers must be exercised before you get to the asset at the end of the chain. If de facto control is enough, by definition, a chain of formal powers must be enough as well. And in this case, we have two very specific powers that, when exercised, give asset, access to an asset which in fact exists. You make the notification, and you call for the lifetime allowance excess lump sum. And, and the 
point about what inequity is deemed to be the asset of the judgment debtor is even further illustrated in the standard wording we see in a worldwide freezing order, um, and indeed the order that was made in this case. Uh, and that can be found in the supplemental bundle, uh, tab 5, page 26. Four of the order notes, and it's a standard wording. Um, the respondent's assets include any asset which he has the power, directly or indirectly, and that's important because in this case it's perhaps indirect, there's two powers, not one, to dispose of or deal with as if it were his own. And it goes on the respondent is to be regarded as having such power if a third party holds or controls the asset in accordance with his direct or indirect instruction. And this morning, my little friend took you to the authorities touching on freezing injunctions to establish the proposition uh, that a freezing injunction should only bite where an asset would be available after judgment to satisfy the judgment debt. And so really, this is illustrating the point in Scarifo, which is that de facto control over an asset can be enough to make that asset available to satisfy the judgment debt. And if that's right, exercising two powers to get there must be enough as well. I mean, I'm not sure if it actually matters for our purposes, but uh, that can't in the end be right, can it? Um, or, or, or quite in that form. Um, uh, get to the stage where judgment has been obtained, you're seeking to enforce, you find some asset that uh, is within the broadest wording in paragraph four. Mm. Um, uh, and, th and then the person's wife comes along and says, no, actually, I'm the owner. I mean, you can't then enforce against her, if, 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 if indeed she is the owner. Uh, if he has so put aside the issue of control because we don't need to go that far but if the husband has the power to require that asset to be handed over to him if she's a trustee for example or even if she's a beneficial owner and there's a, a contract which says she must hand over the property on payment of £10 I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it probably doesn't matter. I mean, this is designed to be wide wording to uh, restrict things before you get to the point of enforcement. Yes, but, but Skorichen was an enforcement decision. Yes. This was after judgment in Skorichen, yes. and it's the appointment of a receiver. And there, the receiver was appointed specifically on the basis of control. Yes, I don't quite know what that means. I mean, if, um, if it is indeed the case that somebody else owns the property, what sort of control could it be that would entitle you to execute against it? I suspect what they're getting out there, my lord, is um, uh, if I'm a, an oligarch and all my assets belong to my chauffeur. If they genuinely belong to the chauffeur, I can't see how you can take them. Whenever I ask him to pass me the assets, he does. I, in a way, my lord, we, we don't need to go there no. this, this appeal, and it's, it's an argument for a different day. Um, but there is grit in there, and it is approved in the Court of Appeal on the issue of control. But we don't need to go there. We have actual powers. And, and what I would say is, what Scrippen does illustrate is, put aside the rightness or wrongness of control, my learned friend's key point is that uh, when you have one power that gets you to an asset straight away, that's fine. Section 37 applies to that. But if you have two, all of a sudden it becomes difficult. And my submission is simply that you can have as many powers as you want in the chain, as long as all of them are yours to exercise totally freely, 
None of them are fiduciary. And they get you to an asset at the end of the chain, then that's good enough for the Section 37 power to be exercised. And if, if it wasn't that way, as I, I said at the outset, it would be trivially easy for people to structure their assets so that they'd be judgment proof. And that's the whole, whole injustice that Section 37 is trying to avoid. And so when finally we get to the Blight decision, Blight and Brewster, which is applying those principles in the context of a pension scheme, and that's tab 15. And, and the relevant part starts at paragraph 59 or 2851 of the judgment, page 2851. Paragraph 59 is significant because it's um, the district judge's judgment which uh, Mr. Moss QC is rejecting. And the district judge says, um, and, and this starts from, from the middle of the passage, the claimants also argued that the court could compel the defendant to elect to take his lump sum now. However, the district judge held, the court cannot force the defendant to make an election that is not in his financial interest. And there is no jurisdiction to make any form of mandatory order against the defendant in these circumstances. And that, in effect, is the submission my learned friend is making. He's saying, ah, well, the election to notify HMRC to withdraw enhanced protection is not in Mr. Green's financial interests. And so you can't do it. And that's precisely the submission that Mr. Moss QC rejected in this case. I mean, he starts by dealing with it as a matter of impression. Uh, which in my submission is significant given that this is a jurisdiction concerned with the demands of justice. He says, as a matter of impression, this would work a substantial injustice to the claimants. The idea that the fraudster can enjoy an enhanced standard of living at his retirement instead of paying the judgment debt would be a very unattractive conclusion. The defendant clearly has the means of paying the 25%. All he has to do is give notice to the pension provider. In our case, all we need to do is give two notices. Um, over the page, at paragraph 68, uh, Mr. Moss QC again considered Tessera. Uh, and he cited the point that the powers of revocation were such that in equity, the letter could be regarded as having rights tantamount to ownership. So again, it's not that the power is property, it's that the rights associated with that power are tantamount to ownership. The same, in my view, must apply to the defendant's ability in the present case to elect to take his cash payment. And we see that again at 70. The present situation is analogous to the situation in Tassa Roof. There appears to me to be a strong principle and policy of justice to the effect that debtors should not be allowed to hide their assets in pension funds when they have a right to withdraw monies needed to pay their creditors. And I ask rhetorically, why should it make a difference that to get to that right, you first have to trigger another right? At this point of my submission, I think it's convenient if I turn up my learned friend's skeleton argument. Oh, yes. You're leaving Blight and Brewster. I, I was intending to. Yes. Is there any different questions? Just on, that? on the mechanics. Mr. Yes. Moran doesn't quarrel with the shortcut that Mr. Moss took. Um, but if one were to go the long way round rather than the short way round, what would it be here? Uh, I, I put it this way Mr. Moss explains that um, paragraph 77, that if he weren't. Um, Going the short way round, he'd appoint a receiver by way of ex equitable execution and require the delegation of the election. 
So that's sort of consistent with Section 37. Yes. It gives the power to appoint a receiver, and requiring the delegation is an injunction, I suppose. Um, uh, so what would you do here? Well, I think in the order, what's happened is that those powers have been delegated to candy solicitors. Yes. And so we just replace that with receiver, and we'd have to find a receiver. And I, I'm not suggesting you should, no. but just to understand how you strictly relate it to Section 37, what would you appoint the receiver receiver of? Um, there are, I suppose there are two ways of conceiving of that. The first is to say he's receiving the assets in the pension fund, and then all the orders around that are ancillary to him doing that. I suppose that's, that's probably what you'd be receiving, appointing a receiver. If it were a matter simply of appointing a, a receiver over the power to write for revenue, that does seem quite odd. You, you, uh, that's not what you're saying. You're saying you appoint a receiver over the, the bundle of rights with ancillary provisions. But if you simply came to court and said, can, I, can you appoint me a receiver of the power to write for revenue, that seems a bit strange. The question is why? Why are you asking? If, if exercising that power in some way advances the rights of the judgment debtor, then whilst it seems odd, why not? Because, I mean, think about it another way. If, if your lordship considers it in another, another fashion, a receiver could be appointed over um, the shares in a company or over some land, and ownership of the land or ownership of the shares of the company come with a, bunch, a whole host of different powers. Yes. In, in, bo in both cases, There'll be many occasions in which you might need to deal with HMRC, you might need to make decisions, elections, you might need to deal with planning applications on the land. All of those, it almost goes without saying that the receiver gets all those powers as well. Yes. You don't, you don't need to. You, you could simply order Mr. Green to write. My lord, we could. Uh, we were simply following the form yes, that Mr. Moskowitz right. identified in Light and Brewster. But, but yes, we could mandate him to do that. And the reason that that would be acceptable, and mandating him to write a song would not be acceptable, is because it's just a notification, and it's a notification that can be delegated. And the delegability of it in, is, is the principal distinction in Casa Ruff, but it's also indicative of why it's just that that particular power um, be reachable in this way. Because it's just it's just a notification, it's just a letter. It's not it's no real um, labour or work or cost to Mr. Green. That's the justice of it. But the advantage of delegation is is that you're not you're less dependent upon compliance by Mr. Green. But precisely, my lord. And there's a second advantage as well, my lord, which is that um, there is a a degree of opacity as to precise the precise extent of Mr. Green's rights under the pension scheme, um, and identifying exactly how the powers that are, be, that are being delegated to be exercised would depend on getting clarity on precisely what those interests are. So, in broad terms, we know it's worth three point seven million, but. Is there, is there anything further on blight or the form of the order? Not from me, thank you very much. And in, in which case I was going to turn to my learned friend's skeleton and just directly address the submissions he made there. Um, and it starts at paragraph 40, uh, page 144 of the bundle, tab 12. And at paragraph 40, my learned friend says, the power to revoke enhanced protection is utterly different from the power to call for the PCLS. He says, at his heart, such a power is not anything like property. Well, my lords, you have my first 
principle submission, which is that the power doesn't need to be property for the Section 37 jurisdiction to be exercisable. All that is required is for there to be assets at the end of the chain of powers to be exercised. That's a misreading of Tassel Ruff to suggest that that's the test. But in any case, my learned friend goes on to say it's nothing like property. He says, it does not give a right to call for or direct payment of property. But of course it does, because once you notify HMRC that you're revoking enhanced protection, you can call for the lifetime allowance excess lump sum. He says, it does not trigger a transfer of property. It's not on its own, but you pull the first trigger, and that entitles you to pull the second trigger to transfer property. The analogy the judge below um, raised, which I adopt, was if you have a locked door and you need two keys to get to the treasure behind, is it really said that section 37 can't apply there, but it can apply where there's only one key? And the third point is, it does not give unfettered access to property. Well, again, no, not on its own, but when taken in conjunction with the lifetime allowance excess lump sum power, it does. Over the page, paragraph 41, what it does is change the tax treatment of property together with allowing different rights to be exercised over other property. I'm, I'm not sure what's being said here. The only property we're concerned with, the only assets we're concerned with, are the pension fund. And what we're doing is we're changing the tax treatment of that pension fund in order to get access to it. The analogy with taking a house and changing it into money by selling it and a tax charge being levied is, in my submission, a, a very close one. Um, you have my submissions on why this is very different from requiring someone to enter into an employment contract. Um, paragraph 42, the point here is that um, what we're doing is creating an asset at a cost to the judgment debtor. And again, my lords, you have my submission. We're not creating an asset. The asset is there. It's the pension fund. Um, and there's no cost directly to Mr. Green. The cost comes out of the asset. Um, and then finally, at paragraph 43, there's an analogy drawn with um, a loan. But of course, that's different because that's requiring the judgment debtor to put funds in to get something out. That's not what's required in this case. So to draw the facts together at the risk of repetition, uh, the Section 37 power is to be exercised in aid of judgment creditors' rights and interests that the judgment debt be satisfied, and that's a strong principle of English law. Crew City. That's all we're asking for. Second, the issue we're concerned with is whether there's an asset that is to be treated as if it were the creditor's property. The pension fund is such an asset, and because that asset can be unlocked by the exercise of unrestricted, unfettered, non fiduciary powers, whether that's one power or two powers or three or four. <coughs> then the jurisdiction under Section 37 is broad enough to allow access to that property. And the third point really is a point from, of incrementalism. Um, there is established authority, which it isn't demurred from, that where there's a single stage power to get at assets in a pension fund, Section 37 can be used to access those assets. And we would say, if the operation to get to those assets is two stages, then either that falls squarely within that established authority, or it's the most minor form of incrementalism to make the order. Um, my lords, those are my submissions on ground one. I pause there in, in case any of your lordships have any further questions. I'm grateful. Um, 
round two. Um, my learned friend's case must be that because Mr. Green was once a bankrupt, and that bankruptcy has ended as a historical fact now, a pre-bankruptcy debt arising from his fraud cannot be executed against his pension fund. And it's important to note that this argument doesn't just apply to the lifetime allowance excess lump sum. It applies to everything we're asking for. So my learned friend is saying that public policy demands that this fraudster should be allowed, in the words of um, Moss QC, to retire a multi-millionaire while the victims of his fraud get nothing. And that's such an extreme result, one would expect it to be explicit in the statutory scheme. Um, and actually, as we'll, we'll see, uh, the statute points to precisely the opposite result. Well, if I could take you to section 2813, it's in the authorities bundle. Tab 2. And this is the effect of a discharge from bankruptcy. And where a bankrupt is discharged, the discharge releases him from all bankruptcy debts. with the exceptions set out below. And one of the important exceptions is subsection three. So actually, before we get to the exception, the idea is you have all your debts, as your auditors will know, you go into bankruptcy, and um, all your creditors only have rights in the bankruptcy. Once you leave your bankruptcy, you're free of your debts. It's a fresh start. But subsection three, discharge does not release the bankrupt from any bankruptcy debt which he incurred in respect of um, or which was secured by means of any fraud or fraudulent breach of trust to which he was a party. And this is such a debt. We're all agreed that this is a debt arising from fraud. And the public policy that is reflected in that provision is that if you've committed a fraud and you've incurred a debt, bankruptcy is not a safe harbour for you. You can never escape the debts you've incurred as a fraudster. That is the public policy that's encapsulated in subsection 3. And so for the creditor, who is the victim of a fraud, or their assignees, once the bankrupt has been discharged, it's as if the bankruptcy never happened. As against that, my learned friend says, the generality of creditors can't access the pension scheme after a bankruptcy. But that's of course true. The generality of creditors can't access anything after a bankruptcy. And my learned friend also accepts that where a debt has been incurred after a bankruptcy, that creditor can access the pension scheme. And so it must necessarily follow that where a judgment debt has been incurred by reason of fraud prior to a bankruptcy, as section 2813 makes clear, that can also be enforced against a pension scheme. If that wasn't the result, you'd be undermining the effect of section 2813. What, what is a little bit striking is that, on your case, you're better off because of the statutory provisions designed to protect pension provisions. As I understand it, the caricature thing's a little. Mm. Uh, because uh, but for the intervention of statute under Rule 11 of the pension rules, um, uh, you might be in difficulties, right? Because of, because of the forfeiture provision. Well, um, should we turn up, my lord, um, Rule 11? Um, it's in the core bundle. Yes. And I've invited your lordships to do that, and I'm not entirely sure exactly where it is. It, it's um, page 114 of the court bundle. Thank you, my lord. At least in way one version. Uh, yes. Um, 
except as specifically provided in the rules, um, on any attempt being made to alienate a benefit or the happening of any event whereby a benefit would become payable to any other person other than a beneficiary determined by the rules, that benefit shall cease and determine. Um, that is not a provision that generates forfeiture on bankruptcy because in the first iteration of section 91, um, pensions under an occupational pension scheme were excluded from the assets that the trustee in bankruptcy would take into account. Um, and also under that provision, um, it, it, it wasn't the case that forfeiture as a result of bankruptcy was excluded. So what you have is you have Rule 11 um, on the bankruptcy, because of Section 91 as originally enacted, the pension doesn't go into the bankruptcy, so it hasn't been assigned to anyone. So the trustee doesn't get it, and it's not cease, it doesn't cease and determine because of that bankruptcy. Sorry, I'm, I haven't got my mind properly around this. Was that true under the old law, under the original version of the legislation? Pre-95. Mal 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 Pre-95, yes. because you didn't have protection from bankruptcy, yes. this would have been triggered on bankruptcy. Yes. Section 95, original version, subsection yes. 3, said occupational pension schemes don't fall into bankruptcy. Section 96, 2 sub little 1, said forfeiture on bankruptcy still works. This type of forfeiture, because it was only triggered if it fell into bankruptcy, wouldn't bite. Other types which said forfeiture will occur if you become insolvent or become a bankrupt would carry on. I was only, I have to say, I was only flagging up section 11 as an example of the sort of things that happened within pension yes, schemes. It's not in, it's not directly applicable in this yep. particular case. Okay. I do, yeah. No, well, I've um, diverged with you. No, 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 no right on this particular point. Great, for convention, very helpful. The other point, of course, is that um, this deed is dated 2006. So it's, it's from, all, it's it's from it's earlier versions, but yes. Well, it's dated from 2006, so it, um, when this deed was executed, the law was as it is. And in any case, uh, your lordship's question was, um, it's odd that we can take advantage of this. And, and my submission is that we're not taking advantage of anything at all, and it's not odd. Um, I mean, it, it, it's supposing the question were apt at all, it probably would be apt in a slightly different case. Um, uh, where, where have I got this right? So that there, there, there would be a situation where a forfeiture clause would have bitten, but for the intervention of the statute, and then the creditor is better off um, uh, because of the intervention of Parliament to protect pension rights. Um. There might be a case where that would be so, not this case. Yes, all right. Um, and, and, I mean, uh, the other point, of course, is that the notion that Section 281 was forgotten when this legislation was passed, there's been reams of legislation in relation to pensions and insolvency. I, I'm, I'm not sure it's a, a, an appropriate approach to statutory construction to say, well, Parliament forgot this bit that it did before. We assume that one has to assume that this was in mind when it was written. And, and for very good reason. There's a very good reason why. Um, a fraudster, should, uh, the victims of a fraud should be in a different position post-bankruptcy. And the real oddness, my lord, is, is this, is um, why should our client's position be any different to a victim of fraud that Mr. Uh, to the victim of fraud that Mr. Green perpetrated after his bankruptcy? And the express policy of Section 2813 is that they shouldn't, it shouldn't be any different. I mean, in any case, my primary submission really ought to be on this, that this was a discretion of my learned friend accepts, and the learned judge addressed the arguments in his judgment, paragraph 53 to 54. He did so economically, but that's no criticism. Uh, he dealt with it. There's no basis to interfere in that discretion. In any case, um, he was right to deal with it economically, because in my submission, the point is obvious. 
Section 2813's explicit statute, or what my learned friend seeks to do, is say that public policy demands a result which is the precise opposite of the result that statute requires. The third point is the public policy is that identified in Blight and Brewster, which is that it would be an outrageous affront to justice for a fraudster to retire a multimillionaire instead of paying his judgment debt. Um, and the fourth point of certain fallacies in my learned friend's argument, he says, I identified the first one, which is the distinction between frauds before and after bankruptcy. 2813 says there should be no distinction. The second point is, it is said that Mr. Green is entitled to the protections afforded by bankruptcy. Yes, but <coughs> not in respect of judgment debts incurred by way of fraud. Um, and the third point is, there is no issue with enforcing against pensions that are in fact in payment. So if Mr. Green chose to call on his pension scheme and get some assets, there's no issue that we can enforce against those. So the only issue is whether we can trigger the election. And for the reasons set out in Blight and Brewster, it's entirely appropriate for us to have that power, or for that power to be delegated to us. My Lord's ground three, unless there are any further questions on ground two. And um, ground three, the, the essence of my learned friend's case is that it's terribly unfair to Mr. Green that extracting funds from his pension scheme um, will generate a tax charge. I think it's perhaps convenient to just set out what, in broad terms, the effect of the order we seek will be. So in broad terms, there's about £3.7 million pounds there. As I say, we, we don't know whether that's accurate or not, but we, we hope it is. Of that, after we've finished doing what we, we hope to do, there'll be just shy of £1 million pounds in Mr Green's pension. Uh, my Lords, the current lifetime allowance for a pension is just a shade over a £1 million. Pounds. So that is the maximum the government currently says you can save tax-free for your retirement. You get different tax regimes afterwards, but that's the lifetime allowance, one, is one, one million pounds. So that's the extent to which the government now says that you should have a taxable benefit. And I mentioned that in support of the submission, that a pension pot that's worth a million pounds is by any means a large pension pot. Mr Green is currently a man who apparently has no assets and must, one assumes, uh, and has no income, or very little income, and one must assume He's living a commensurately, commensurately um, Spartan lifestyle. A million pound pension pot is ample. <coughs> On any view, and this, there was no evidence of this at first instance to suggest what sort of income Mr Green might expect from an attachments of earnings order. But on any view, a million pound pension pot, which is at or around the amount the government entitles you to save totally tax free, or with the tax-free benefits that come with a pension scheme. On any view, that is a generous pension pot. And on any view, that's plenty to meet any sort of attachment of earnings. I mean, just to be clear, uh, you would hope that you wouldn't keep all of the benefit of a million. No, we wouldn't. But, but that, that, that we, 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 precisely, my lord, we're, we're seeking a substantial part of that. But that's all to be decided when we come to the attachment of earnings order. The only point we're making now is that whatever is decided then, a million pounds will be ample to cover it. Yeah. Uh, my learned friend suggested that an annuity that could be bought with a million pounds would be about thirty thousand um, pounds, and he said it, it's got worse over the past two weeks. And um, as it happens, my lords, the effect of gilt rates go uh, gilt yields going up is that you get a bigger annuity because the way you get annuities, you they go out and buy yields, they match them better. So. We have no evidence as to what annuity that would purchase. Um, but whatever it is, it's a normal sum of money for a normal person to live on. But in any event, none of this was raised at first instance. We, we don't have the transcript in the bundle. Um, but it is the case that my learned friend 
in discussion with the judge, effectively said, it doesn't make a difference to my client because the debt is bigger than the pension bond. So that's dealing with the facts. Dealing with the... I have six submissions to make on this point. Um, the first submission is that there's no basis to interfere with the judge's exercise of his discretion. The judge identified the factors put to him at the hearing below, and he dealt with them in his judgment. And as my uh, Lord, Lord Justice Mayles identified, one really has to pass the words of that judgment um, to identify some very particular words used to say, well, well, the judge didn't take that into account. He plainly did. He identified it in the first part of his judgment, and then he goes to it later. But in any case, the judge's exercise of his discretion was correct. Um, my lords, I took you to Crew City, which identifies the powerful public policy that judgment debts should be complied with. Um, and that is the powerful public policy that is being met in this case. Um, the third point was the point I was discussing at the outset, which is um, the judgment debt is greater than the total in this pension pot. Once we exercise the powers in the way we wish to, there's around a million pounds left in the scheme, which should generate an income which will be in excess of what Mr Green would get from an attachment of earnings order. And there's been no evidence put that anything else is the case. And the fourth point raised is that um, oh, well, the tax charge is very high. Well, my lord, tax is a fact of life. This isn't a case where the tax charge wipes out the entire benefit of enforcement. It's 55%. There is still a very large, very material benefit to us in the order of £1.3 million, immediately payable to satisfy the judgment debt. The point is that would very neatly and I won't take you to it, but by His Honour Judge Matthews in the Break and Guy case, and, and just for your Lordship's notice, tab 20, paragraph 72 of the judgment. And a comparison is made with capital gains tax on the, on, the, on the sale of land. That could be a very substantial tax, but the tax is payable and a very substantial amount is left for the judgment creditor. And that's the position here. This isn't a case where the tax liability wipes out any real benefit the judgment creditor. As to the cases where a remedy wasn't granted because the debtor's interests were taken into account, um, my learned friend relied on G, uh, G rather, and um, uh, the Camdex case. Of course, in the Camdex and Samibia case, the banknotes were worthless to the judgment creditor and the effect of enforcement or a freezing order in that case would be to collapse the Zimbabwean economy. We're a million miles away from that case here. The effect is to provide <coughs> immediate assets of 1.3 million for my client and there is a tax charge which is a little bit more than that. And of course, one mustn't overstate the tax charge of 55%, because if that tax charge wasn't levied and money came out of the scheme in the ordinary way, Mr. Green would be charged on that according to his marginal rate of income tax. All right, I follow that. On the figures we've got, that might not be very much. I mean, I, it, well, my, my Lord, if, if the entire 3.7 million is avail made available to him, and um, this was discussed at the hearing below, and at the hearing below, um, I've addressed this in my skeleton argument, uh, which is at tab 13. Um, Mr Green's uh, pension, it was discussed at the hearing below um, during an adjournment, that if um, Mr Green just called for a pension, 
the net payments to him after tax would be £95,000 per annum. So one grosses that up. A, a substantial part of that is charged with a marginal rate of 45% at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if it would assist, I can go away. No, 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 I don't think it does. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's somewhat speculative. I mean, suppose you, you take out the lump sum you're, that can be taken anyway, there's still, you say, three million odd or whatever it is. But if we don't take the LA ELS, yes. we can only take um, the uh, tax free lump sum, which is in the order of 380. Yes. So you'd, you'd be left with about 3.4 million pounds. Yes, I see. And even if you're only 55, does that generate a very large annual pension? It does not. Um, he lives in Spain, so maybe that makes a difference. But anyway, I don't think we need to go any further with this. My Lord, no. The, 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 so the point is that there is a tax charge, it's a large tax charge, but that would only be a reason not to grant the remedy we seek if it effectively wiped out any real benefit or if it was wholly disproportionate to the benefit. And where the tax charge is 55%, just a shade over half, there's obviously a very real benefit to my client. The sixth submission is to address a point raised in my learned friend's skeleton argument. And um, he says in that skeleton argument that if an order was not made, then it is likely an offer of settlement would be forthcoming, which would be more valuable to my client. Uh, now isn't the time to get into the law of without prejudice privilege, but in, in my submission, by making that submission, you've opened up the content of the without prejudice communication. And so, I, well, I don't want to. Let's not let's not go there, my lord. I, but I, I think if you wanted to refer us to without prejudice communications, we really would have to pause and. Uh, indeed, my lord. Well, I won't. I won't. I, I merely make this point. The notion that not making an order would encourage this recalcitrant fugitive and fraudster, and I use those words advisedly. That's from the judgment from voluntarily offering to give us more money is a nonsense. We're here today because he doesn't want to pay the judgment debt. So the notion that not making an order would encourage him to do so is absurd. And the judge, at first instance, rightly discarded that. What might encourage an offer to settle would be making the order. And if there's a better way of getting the money that we seek, no doubt when you make the order, when this court makes the order, then that will become apparent. But of course, that's not the, we're not seeking the order for that purpose. We're seeking the order because of the very substantial funds it will give us. Well, I suppose it might be said that you are the best judges of your own interests. Indeed, my So in relation to ground three, um, there's no basis to interfere in the judge's discretion. He considered the point in the round. And even if there were, all the factors, all the factors, point towards granting the relief we seek. And my Lord, those are my submissions. Unless there's any questions from the Lordship. No. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Brown. Thank you for minor points. Um, I should have mentioned during my submission, uh, in my skeleton, uh, paragraph 68, there's a footnote 4 where I say uh, the figures in the judgment, uh, I'm not quite sure they're right, I withdraw that footnote. My learned friend pointed out I had failed to take into account 2016 individual protection, the figures in the judgment are correct.
There are two primary points I want to flag up in relation to ground one from my learned friend's submission, and one in terms of how we approach it. Two primary points are, number one, there is a change to the property in question, and number two, we don't care if it's one or two steps. If it's one or two steps, never had a problem with that. And if I didn't make it clear in my own initial submissions, that's not the issue. That will be form over substance. If you have to write to two people to exercise a power, it doesn't make a difference. It's still a single power. If you have to take two steps to get access to property, it's still access to property. The problem in this case is that you don't have simple access to property. And this is a point that my learned friend utterly fails to address. You don't get the right to call for this property, to drop the LAUS and get exactly, uh, sorry, the enhanced protection and get exactly what you were entitled to for. It is not equivalent to or akin to or similar to property or ownership if to get what you're going at at the end of the corridor costs you money. Because the ultimate test of ownership is do you get to control it without any 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 requirement? Now, taxes might be charged and so on and so forth, but is it changing what you get before you can access it? That's the problem. So, Well, the tax actually arises uh, a bit further down the line, doesn't it? I mean, I, I no, it comes in this out case, there are two tax consequences. First of all, when you trigger the lifetime allowance excess lump sum, there is the 55% tax charge. Now, if you already had a right to a lifetime allowance excess lump sum, you could call for that, just like you could call for your 25% <coughs> lump sum tax-free, etc. And it would just be the same as anything else that there's a tax charge. But this changes your tax-free lump sum. It drops from 350,000 to a little under 300,000. Then if you have 2016 individual protection, it goes up to about 312. It isn't just that there is a tax charge if you exercise this particular right. Equally, if you called upon it to draw down an, an annuity, you'd have income tax every time you got your monthly pension. No problem with that. This changes what you are entitled to, and it has not been referred to. As I said in my, my submission, if they already had the if my client already had the right to call for the drawdowns and it didn't change anything else, Blind Brewster, it's akin to property. I couldn't argue anything else isn't the case here. And he missed that entirely. He kept on going on about, oh, if you can use two keys versus one. I don't care about two keys versus one. I care about whether I have to pay for a second key. It's not my property if I have to buy a second key to get in through the door. And it's not my property if, going through this door, I lose 20% of the assets behind it. That's the problem. And I equally, I just emphasize, we, can't, we don't say that you can't make the exercise of a power which is contrary to your own interest subject to a Section 37 order. Because just like a charging order is pretty much likely to be contrary to a debtor's interest, of course you can do that. That's the whole point about enforcement. It's not the fact that it's contrary to their interest. It's the fact that it is not property that they're being forced that it's not an enforcement against property, it's changing what you actually do. And the, the only other minor point on, on ground one was my learned friend made the analogy with a loan, he said that that requires a judgment just to put funds in to get something out, which is why you can't order it. That's not what requ is required in this case. Well, here we have the, the respondent, the defendant, uh, claimant respondent, 
using form over substance. Because whether I have to put my hand into this pocket to pay for this, or I have to put my hand into the asset that's over there to pay for it, it's still a cost to me. And it, even if you describe it as something else, it's still a change of the asset. It's not a problem. That was ground one. Ground two, I'd simply flag up uh, whilst pointing out all the points about whether or not it's discretion in Section 281, he hasn't actually addressed any of the points about whether or not pensions actually should have a public policy behind it, or behind protection. And then on ground three, um, two minor points, well, clarity points. The lifetime allowance is up or down, but it's not the be all and end all of tax liabilities and tax benefits to a pension scheme. It's, it, it caps out what you can get by way of your tax free lump sum. And it caps out above that if you're taking more than that, what happens with your lifetime allowance, excess lump sum and charges and the like. Uh, there are other benefits, blah, blah, blah. I, I, it's, it's not as simple as a lifetime allowance. And in any event, if there is a revocation of enhanced protection, we've got a lifetime allowance dropping from 1.5 to just above 1 million. It's 1 million and 70 odd pounds, I think. Um, and I would emphasize, we, we said that the, we said at first instance that the application of an order on this wouldn't make any difference at the moment because of the worldwide freezing order. Um, in any event, that is how it works. Whether or not we said it in the first instance, that is how it works. Well, was there any other questions? No, nope, I don't expect any. So, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. Um, uh, thank you both very much for your submissions uh, and also for the efforts of those behind you. Um, as you'd anticipate, we won't give judgment here and now. Uh, following what has become the practice, we'd expect judgment to be handed down uh, remotely rather than uh, in the courtroom, uh, but even were it to be handed down in court, uh, as I'm sure you know, no one uh, need attend. Um, in advance of the hand down, uh, you will in all way be provided with a draft for you to uh, correct our uh, typing and English, but um, uh, not to re-argue the case. Uh, and uh, again, in advance of hand down, we'd be grateful if you'd seek to agree in order dealing with consequential matters and if there are points on which you can't agree we'd be grateful for brief written submissions and we would expect to deal with the points in the order that we make. Um, you're probably all too well aware of the Council General for Wales case in the Court of Appeal recently stressing the uh, importance of maintaining uh, the confidentiality of draft judgments and the potential consequences to those who don't. Um, I think you've already provided a representation list giving the names, the email addresses of those who should receive the draft, uh, and I'm assuming there are no uh, revisions to that. To that. Um, I would um, stress once again uh, the need to maintain uh, confidentiality. Um, with that, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much.